they, my agent was like, look, you're, they're expecting you to do well. They're, they reckon you might sell 10% of the tickets in the first week. I sold 40% of the tickets in the first hour. Come on, my guy. With no, and, and this was the same day I was told by Radio 1 that I wasn't. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. They were like, they were like, yeah. well, you don't fit our demographic anymore. But you're playing Coldplay mm. and Liam Gallagher. Mm. Yeah, but you you know, you're you're a bit old. You're playing Coldplay and Liam Gallagher. Yeah, but you're from a different era. You're playing Coldplay and Liam Gallagher. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, that yeah. thing. But then, we, and then we looked at the ticket uh, sales, and it was like forty percent. We sold fifteen thousand tickets in a day. Yeah, and. 40% of them were 18 to 21 year olds, which means I've got this whole new generation of fans. That so what's your fucking problem, playing exactly these people? Killer, killer, podcast. Killer, killer, official .com. You need the Kellervision app. 24 7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Music and street culture. Podcast. I feel like we should be looking at each other, but instead we're like, <laughs> like we're presenting a show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, this is part of the random uh, escapades of the Killer Killer Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Killer Podcast live and direct central London, or central as you need to be, could be or want to be. My new guest will testify to that. Um, it's definitely central. <laughs> big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Everyone's got a television app. Listen, sharing is caring, all right? I'm doing this for my health, all right? You share away and tell a friend to tell a friend. Um, inside the house, we have a man that I've known way before his Kickstarters, um, before he changed the way uh, he, he allowed them to kiss him. It's, <laughs> uh, it's the mighty example in the house. Did you freestyle that or did you, yeah, write, you well, wrote that this morning? No, I didn't. I literally you wrote free that in the shower. Can you Tell I freestyled it. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit weird. Um, example inside the place. How you doing, my brother? Yeah, I'm wicked, bro. I'm wicked. I'm uh, just in doing like a sort of whistle stop tour of the UK. I'm um, I'm here for six weeks. I'm, I'm sort of packing because obviously I live in Oz now. I'm uh -huh. picking. I'm packing. It feels like about six months of work into six weeks. Six, well, yeah, because I mean, to, and in fairness, for him to even be here is a good look because you were really toiling on, oh, I don't know if I've got time. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's I didn't know, but I, just, I had to get my first few weeks out of the way. Like, um, so I've, I've, I've lived in Brisbane now, I had to get a special exemption to fly here. <laughs> I got bumped twice off flights, it's mental. Yeah, it's, I've been Australia, following this. Yeah. Australia's like the hardest place to get into and the hardest place to get out to at the moment. Because <sighs> they, they, they were doing so well with COVID mm. and then they just completely fucked it up mm. because. Um, was it? They didn't roll out the vaccines. They didn't. They didn't. They were only, they only just started about three, four months ago. Yeah, we are like, ahead. I mean, the UK is The ahead. UK was looking like a shit show for a while, mm. and now it's like one of the best places to yeah, be. Yeah. Australia, I mean, I live in Brisbane where it's, everything's cool, mm. but if you're in Sydney or Melbourne... Forget it, man. You're just stuck in, indoors all yeah. day. Still, like my sister's been in lockdown in Bondi Beach for like 12 weeks with her kids. Man, and is that, so that's the same, what, so Sydney, because that's like a metropolitan city. That's yeah, like yeah, a Sydney one. is absolute fact at the moment. Really? Um, but enough about that. Yeah, enough about that, because that'll date it. We're evergreen, ever. When you say about Central, I mean, yeah, you have travelled such a distance to be around London and Orbit. What's it like? What's the comparables? Like, what's it like being uh, well, you, an expat now? What's it like being in, in Australia compared to here? Uh, Australia, like, it took us a while, my wife and I to find our good friends, our good, you know, our people, yeah. you know, like-minded people. Um, it was uh, it was a bit tough the first year. Her mum and dad and brothers lived there. My mum and dad moved there 15 years ago. Mm. They live on the Gold Coast about an hour away from us in Brisbane. Mm. So for the first year, it felt like our family were our friends. So I didn't really have my music people. I didn't have a producer. I didn't know mm. any rappers or singers. I didn't know any DJs. Mm. I didn't know anyone, uh, any chefs, because I love my cooking so much. I didn't really... Like, just people to link with and, yeah, and yeah. like, just not talk about, you know, everyone's in construction or they're an estate agent. Mm. And, like, I can go out and have a, a, a nice lunch with them. Yeah. But I, it took a while to find my people. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But we, my wife and I, she's, she's a model presenter. She was an actress. She was a neighbours for a bit. She's just done a, a SAS Australia, the celeb one. I think I've seen this. Again, you know, she's a, as a she's mate. She's an action woman. Yeah, she's on it, isn't she? But, yeah, so she, we moved there because we wanted to give our kids a better life. Kids have got an amazing life. You know, we wake up, it's 6 a.m., it's lovely and sunny. We walk down the hill to drop them at school. My wife and I go mountain biking or swimming or play tennis, you know, before we might start work at 11 or 12 some days. Um, we've got it good, man. I think all the, all the years of hard work I put in between maybe... Even when I met you, two thousand and six, five, six. Cool, you when you were going before, way before then, though, right? Yeah, I mean, oh, I was geez. my first release was two thousand and 
three. Yeah. But um, when I, I can't remember where I met you at, was it uh, the, the Camden Underground or yeah, it was a show something? Before that, yeah. Well, it might have been Deal Real. Yeah. I don't know. But it was yeah. about like 2004 yeah. or five. Anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, God, that's a mirror. Yeah, the, I think. I, I I did about six or seven years of really struggling, like mm. making no money, but doing maybe 40, 50 gigs a year for maybe 50 pounds or 100 pounds, mm. playing support slots um, or playing in pubs or open mics, just whatever I could. And then I started, I was about, I signed to Skinner's label, obviously, mm-hmm. 2007, there you go. six. First album came out in 2007, that flopped. Mm. Although I sort of had a little fan base, it was like ninety percent sort of eighteen year old boys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hold on, hold on, and this is this was an interesting um, pick because I remember we were on a tour bus. I can't remember. I think it was Plan, it was plan B. B. Yeah, it's Plan B. That was one. And uh, you said something that was quite. It's it's actually stuck with me for a long time. It, uh, wow. Yeah, I'm, man. I'm for ready one. for this. Yeah. I'm ready. You said the reason why Mike signed you was because of the tone of your voice. Yeah. Now I felt that set precedence to everything that came after. Okay. Fair because. Enough. Because the way you sing, it's your natural voice. The way you rap, it's the, didn't, everything is... Because a lot of people, they rap in a different voice that they talk yeah. and they sing in a different voice. And it all voice. hangs and on I, your tone, man. It and does. I, yeah, I think, yeah, Skinner, when he signed me, he was just like, look, I want to... He goes, like, you're not going to be the Beastie Boys um, because, you know, you've got a, quite a soulful, deep voice. Mm. And I don't want you shouting and mm. doing this fake thing. He's like, you need to find your, your sound. And I don't... I don't think I found it with that first album. I kind of felt like my first album, I learned what not to do. Mm. And not that I look back on the album and dislike it. There's some really nice moments on there. Mm. I mean, we had like 27 samples on the album, so I was never going to make any money from it. <laughs> you know, we sampled... Leave the, that off Spotify. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we sampled cut the Carpenters and Muddy Waters and Kylie Minogue. Yeah. And but you kind of took the hit because you, it's the first album. You kind of just absorbed all yeah, the Yeah, I didn't really know what I was doing. And then I was going to quit music and go to Australia um because my mum and dad had just moved there um because they were just they realized if they stayed in england they'd be working till they were dead so my dad just sort of like upped and left and mm. sold his house uh, in fulham because it was like when they moved it was three dollars for the pound that's the only reason they could they sort of went because like at the moment i think it's made 1.8 dollars for the pound but imagine going to australia and traveling your money you're, that, you're was the re- yeah, that was the only mad. reason they went i think pretty much and it was obviously an amazing country to yeah. live in and um and i was going to go with them too I was working in TV at the time, and the Ministry of Sound approached me. A guy called Dave Dollymore. I actually had bumped into him last week in Kensington. I had a nice catch up with a beer with him. He's now running RCA Records. Right. And he, uh, he's one of the good ones. Yeah. Most A&Rs, yeah. absolute dickheads. I haven't got, <laughs> I haven't got a clue. Fellow <laughs> musicians. There's some A&Rs that watch this. So, but, you know, I mean, you know, we won't be specific on who, but I mean, a lot it's of, none of you lot. You know, like the ones where they're like, oh, I, I was in a band. I know about music. It's yeah. like, no, the reason you, your band didn't yeah. work is because you don't know anything about music. Yeah, yeah. And now you're trying to tell me about music. <laughs> anyway, um, he was just like, he was like, what's your view on electronic music? I was like, well, I love The Prodigy. Mm. I love Basement Jacks. I love Faithless. Mm-hmm. Um, I love Chemical Brothers. He was like, well, I think you, everything you're doing in terms of your voice is good and your storytelling's great. He goes, I think you should try singing and I think you should try dance music. And I was like, well, I don't know any dance producers. And he was like, don't worry about that. I mean, like, I kind of knew, I knew Calvin Harris kind of just from MySpace. But how did you and meet then, him? How did you meet, um, uh, before all the Calvins and all that, but how did you meet the A&R guy? How did that, how so did So my he... manager, Mick Shiner. Big up, Mick. Mick, Mick, we got Mick. So um, Mick discovered, pretty much discovered Plan B and the Streets. That's it. Yeah. Uh, and, and published them. He never managed them. He there was a label that he had as well, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so uh, he used to run Locked On and 679 it. Recordings That's and right. Pure Groove up in Archway. Mm. Um, so there was a, a kind of nice little community there. My, my, my manager, he's not my manager anymore. We parted ways a few years ago. We still like talk all the time. Mm-hmm. But he had a really good run of success with like, he had Metronomy, yeah. Plan B, <sighs> me... And the streets. Um, where Yo, that of, is a yeah, a nice legacy. Yeah, proper. Um, and he he was managing me, and he was just like, I don't, I don't. And this is back when I had my. Remember, I had my sort of big, my sort of Mick Jagger floppy. <laughs> I've had all the shit. It's kind of the indie, the indie look. I mean, yeah. you have had all the shit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I know you changed it. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're still going strong, right? The shit haircut, pop, pop <laughs> yeah. um, And he just was like, he said, "Look, come meet this guy at Ministry. I think you'll like him." And uh, he weren't initially my kind of guy because I usually like big personalities. I don't like pe- people who are calm and considered because mm. I'm like, you're not on my wavelength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Very, but, and that's what I needed. I needed someone calm and considered. 
the the, the oh, fire with the water. Yeah, 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 the yin and yang. The and yes. um, he, um, he, I, I actually, I just met Chase and Status, and I just met Sub Focus. Mm. Uh, my manager knew MJ Cole. Uh, do you remember Hervé? Josh, of course, of course, of course yeah. right. Lives so, there, I think, Josh, Joshy Hervé. Yeah. Uh, I'd met him uh, at a gig in like Camden or. It's probably Shoreditch. Short mm. Everything was always Shoreditch around them times, like 2006, <laughs> wasn't it? It still kind of is, except not uh, as cool as when we were. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not as cool as yeah. Well, come on. We've got cooler haircuts now. Uh, yeah, exactly. We can fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so I realised all of a sudden, I was like, actually, we've got like the backbone of an album here mm. from just for these contacts. Sub Focus was blowing up in drum and bass, but wasn't yet massive. Mm. So I made, I've only ever made one song with Sub Focus. He's obviously now, I'd say apart from Chase and Status and Wilkinson, He's probably the biggest yeah, drum yeah, bass yeah. DJ in yeah. the world. Andy and, C. And behind the scenes of what Andy C, yeah, But yeah, I mean, as sure. a, in terms of production, probably yeah. the, one of the best ever. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say Chase the State, Focus, Pendulum, they're the three you. best yeah. of all time. And they've come to fruition for that reason, you know? They, yeah. You know, the cream don't rise for I no did reason. one song with Sub Focus, and that was Kickstarts. Um, that was produced, but of course it was. And, he, and then he's been scared to do another song with me since because he was just like, well, how are we ever going to beat that? And I was like, well, we could give it a go. <laughs> but, um, and then I did a song with Calvin, I did a song with MJ Cole, I did a song with Chase of Status, and then Don Diablo, who's now massive in Europe, more like um, that sort of EDM house hmm. um, sound. But he's probably one of the biggest DJs in the world now, but at the time was just big in Holland. Um, so he reached out to me again, I think, through MySpace. So the whole album was kind of made from a few Ministry of Sound contacts and a few MySpace and Twitter contacts. And then that was kind of like my recipe after that. After I did kick, so I had a few like top 10s and top 20s. I was never, I didn't really ever care about charts. Mm. I just wanted, but that's, you say that when you haven't had a chart hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as soon as you've had a chart hit, you just want more. Yeah, 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 that's right. Because it's almost like, I was making hip hop. It was like a wonky hip hop, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like, um, I didn't feel like I had a real groove to it where people could dance to it or mosh to it. Yeah, that's the that's It was more like thing, a boom, it? bam. It's got a feel boom, right, boom, hasn't boom, it? Bam, yeah, yeah. Boom. It was a very wonky, awkward yeah, yeah, yeah. hip hop. It had it, it had its it had its charms. Yes, that's right. But it wasn't like a a head sort of uh, sort of hip hop, you know what, what I mean? And and here's the thing, and in the in the crossover where Grime was coming along, there was also that UK hip hop task force kind of Yeah, yeah. And you Rightly so as well. You fitted right in the pocket of both. Yeah. But there wasn't an audience for that. There wasn't an audience. At and the then, time. And then, and that's like, so this is 2009. So there wasn't, no, the Americans hadn't yet invented the stupid term EDM either. Mm, mm. Um, <laughs> right, it's called dance music, not electronic yeah. dance music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's electronic. No, dance music's electronic. No, this is. Ele- we we got to own this. But you were on. We're gonna own this. <laughs> you were on the crisp of a wave, and I remember. Yeah, because Kickstarts. It sounds like if you look back, you go, "It's an EDM song," but yeah. it was actually two years before all of that. Oh, totally. We were there. It was me. Does it offend you? Yeah. We just done a couple of gigs. We were in this festival, and I remember. I do remember it so well. Where you, we'd all had a drink, and you come up to us, and you're like, oh, "I've just signed to ministry. I'm gonna be." And we, we all looked at you like, "Yeah, yeah, right, Elle, sure." Yeah, right. Fucking blew up like Mental, the fuck up. Like I was like, yo, okay, it's serious. Yeah, well, that kick- Kickstarter was number three, but it also was the first one that sort of got me attention outside the UK. All of a sudden, I got my gig. Got, my gig fees probably went tenfold. Yeah, you know, it was like <laughs> it was like getting five hundred quid a gig to maybe like ten bags a show. I was yeah. just like, what? And they were like, and yeah, yeah, they want you know, they want to see you in Hungary and Austria and Germany and Sweden and Norway. And is it because the industry had had the opportunity to actually raise? a project that they intuitively knew how to market? That's probably... I think that Ministry of Sound, the marketing team, knew exactly who my fan base were and how to find them. I mm. think that's what they smashed it with. I mean, my audience seemed to be like 90% male, like 18-year-old kids. Mm. And then it seemed to change to sort of 50-50 girls and guys from like 15 all the mm. way up to 40. Because I see someone in the Ministry audience, knew man. exactly where They're young to too. sell that... Yeah. The, those CDs. Um, my gigs now. There's people in their sixties in the back, like old ravers. I mean, mm. it's, the mad, the mad thing for me now is I'm 40 next year. My tour that's just gone on sale for January, February next year. We bear in mind most people's tours are struggling. Yeah. Like, everyone's. They well, said postponed, 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 and like uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, they, my agent was like, look, you're. They're expecting you to do well. They're, they reckon you might sell 10 percent of the tickets in the first week. I sold 40 percent of the tickets in the first hour. <laughs> Come on, my guy. With no, and, and this was the same day I was told by Radio One that I wasn't. Yeah, I saw that. Co- yeah. They were like, they were like, yeah. well, you don't fit our demographic anymore. But you're playing Coldplay mm. and Liam Gallagher. Mm. Yeah, but you, you know, you're you're a bit old. You're playing Coldplay and Liam Gallagher. Yeah, but you're from a different era. You're playing Coldplay and Liam Gallagher. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. That yeah. Thing. But then, we, and then we looked at the ticket uh, sales, and it was like 
40 percent we sold 15,000 tickets in a day yeah and 40 percent of them were 18 to 21 year olds which means i've got this whole new generation of fans that, so what's your who, fucking problem playing exactly people? you're pricks anyway but <laughs> what's mad now is the people coming to this tour next year mm. would have been 11 when say change the way you kiss me was number one mad so how does that make you feel when you think it's about crazy because it? yeah. it just then because i think everyone has it you think everyone has a certain shelf life but it just goes to show that there's always new people discovering music. Mm. And it's mad. Like, I played Sundown Festival in Norwich the other week. And it was, we had 15, 20,000 people watching mm. us. And we were third on the main stage. And then the acts that came on afterwards like, played to less and less. It was almost like... I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that in a mean way. I, I do get competitive. Mm. But I just love the fact that we had the biggest crowd of the entire weekend. Mm. And the crowd were pretty much all 20. Competitive is what... But they know there. all my... Because I've got all these bass line tunes as well. You've got like a song with mm. Darksea and a drum and bass song with Canine. And then I've got like a song with Jaws. Um, so I've got this heavy bass section in the mm. middle where the mosh pits are like... something like a prodigy gig. You know, like 50, 100 foot wide mm. mosh pits. I still need to get to one because obviously I saw the... What I think you did... What was it the BBC in the park Hackney thing that was fucking 2014 15 or something? Yeah, that oh, was the year that Jay Z headlined. Yeah, uh, yes. Oh, and um, that was, it was Jay Z, Kanye, Ed Sheeran. I think Rihanna Kasabian, was there as well. Me. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that was the main stage. And that's when I last saw you. Uh, who's your DJ? Wire. Wire. Big up Wire. DJ Wire. Yeah, man. Um, let's go back to Norwich. I remember my brother. Uh, God, now we're pushing. The last gig I did with you was Norwich. I had the hump that day. I can't remember what it was specifically, but I had the hump and I walked in. I was like sitting there like, I think it was something to do with radio playlists probably. And I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself. Was this, whose gig was it? Mine or your plan B's? I, you know, it was a combination. I think, I think you were the top of the, the, the headline, but it was, a, it was a combination of us and a little lone guy called Ed Sheeran. Oh yeah, Ed Sheeran, yeah. And and he came into the, the backstage room where yeah, we were. Yeah, it was me. The head, yeah, the lineup was me, yep. you, Ed Sheeran. Bonkers. Fuck, that is the last gig we played together. Yeah. That was. I think we jumped on stage and jammed together as well. I think we did that as well. That was two thousand and nine. Long time ago, bro. It's just before he blew, but you know. Yeah, because I I just released Mad. um a song called Hooligans, um, which. Zane Lowe made hottest record in the world. That was kind of like where it started again for me because mm. Radio 1 said to me in 2008, they said to my radio plugger, example will never be played this at Radio 1, ever. We just, we don't like him, we don't get him. And then a year later, Zane gave me hottest record in the world. And then in the four years that followed, we had 18 A-list records. So kiss that ass. But that's why I always say to people, just don't give up. Just, yeah. just stick to your guns, do what you want to do. And even now I'm being told by radio, all radio stations, mm. apart from like... You might get a little specialist play on a dance show. Yeah, yeah. On big up the specialist, big up, big, big up. up the specialist. But the, the shows are getting, radio's getting more and more like Spotify mm. because they're because radio are competing with Spotify. Mm. Instead of being more radio like to make themselves more original, mm. a more original content, more chat, more original um, song plays, mm. uh, up and coming acts, whatever. They're going the opposite. They're trying to copy pl a playlist in Spotify, so they're being told to talk less. Yeah. To do less competitions, less phone-ins. We should be the opposite. We should be the opposite. Be, yeah. And like that's what I mean. Like Radio One's just lost Annie Mack and Nick Grimshaw, mm. two of the the best broadcasters mm. this country's ever had. Mm. And mm. and people who were you know Annie could play what she wanted pretty much. Grimmy would be able to play, I don't know maybe five or six free plays in mm. two hour slots. Mm. That's still quite powerful yeah, thing to do right. if you want to give audience to new mm. an, an, an act a new audience. Um, so it's just it's quite sad. That's the one thing I do love about Australia is Triple J. I love Triple J. Triple J in Australia J. is kind of like BBC Six Music. That's right, it is, yeah. And they, they will, so say a new album comes out by me or yeah, yeah. whatever, instead They're of playing, it. they might not even play the lead single. They'll play the album intro. That's right. They'll just go, with the new shit. example records out, and hey, you know, you know the new single's flying, but I want to play you my favourite track from the album. And it's the intro. And then, <laughs> He's and, got the you know what I mean? Down. And then, and it's like, what a, that's how radio should yeah, be. Yeah. Yeah. Introducing and discovery. Yeah. Um, I have found that when I would be in a, in another country, the radio would be on, and you'd listen to like, I don't know, Motorhead, and then all of a sudden it would be like, I don't know, um, Anastasia or some shit. <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, what the fuck's going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they just don't go with the status quo or the, the, the you know, the, the playlist agenda. Yeah, yeah. They go with what they... When you think of like Kappa FM, 
Mm. You're listening. I mean, like, do you remember when you used to like listen to, I mean, like Chris Tarrant breakfast show or something? <laughs> and most of it was just him going, you know, just the, the bong game, you know, it's just, just all games and chat and they'd be reading the newspapers and taking the piss. And did you hear about this funny uh, story that happens? A bit like Chris Evans show. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, and, now, and now everything's just like, hey, you're listening to Capital coming up in a minute. Another song. And now here's this song. Bye. And that's it. And then the commercial. And that's meant to be broadcasting. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking ridiculous, man. It's ridiculous. I find now podcasts are just like, because I love listening to them, <laughs> that it's a great way to, because if you get to tell your story, it's a great way to pick up new fans. 100%. Or followers. Because sometimes yeah. I get people follow me and they DM me and go, by the way, I heard you on such and such podcast mm. the other day. You seem like a nice guy. I really like what you said about blah, blah, blah. And now I've discovered your music. I love that. It's wicked, it's isn't it? It's the same thing with podcasting, to be fair. Do you know what I mean? The fact that, each person that comes on is, is a, has a level of cosign and it's, it, it validates your existence and that's the same sort of principle. It's that... kind of like, I feel like back in the day, like talk shows, mm. but people, aren't, people have no patience now. People just want everything instantly. instantly. They want everything has to be on demand. Like, mm. And podcasts are kind of like, uh, for me, they're like, whether they're audio, like if they're audio, they're kind of like old school, like Radio 4. If they're mm. visual as well, it's that YouTube generation thing. Yeah. And it's kind of like... I want to know about this person right now and what they've got to say and I'm going to skip through if I don't like that bit and I'm going to skip through yeah, yeah. and it's top, just top, like top, I'm going to get yeah, everything yeah. I want and it's the same way people consume everything now they consume music like mm. it they want a they want a quick fix on if they like a person as well mm. but someone told me this bloke's really interesting I'm going to go listen to this podcast mm. and I've decided oh, I don't like him mm. or I don't like him as much as my mm. or my friend said he's hilarious I don't think he's funny because I skipped through it really quickly interesting and it's the same thing with TV show I didn't yeah. make it past episode one so I don't like it skip yeah, exactly. And you think about all those box sets on Netflix that people don't end up watching because yeah. they see the first, t what, 20 minutes of the program. Exactly. And whereas before, you used to actually, I'm going to listen to this radio show for two hours and maybe there's something I like, or I'm going to watch this TV show for an hour and maybe there's something I like. Is that a shame? Yeah, I kind of miss that. Yeah, I miss that too. But I, I know that I don't have the same patience either. Mm, yeah, I know. And you kind of, yeah, yeah, lead by your own examples, isn't it? That's yeah. the um, a friend of mine, or someone, it was a little while ago, you know, she, she was, a, and still is a big fan of you. And one thing that she loved about Example was the fact that you're relatable. Okay. Just going into the subject of, like, switching on and off. And you, you're clearly on right now, people. I, know, I can tell by the, the glint in your eyes. But, uh, yeah, it's because you're approachable, because you're, 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 you're there's an element of lad next door. There's, there's the banter, heavy banter. You've always been a bants man. And it comes across in the music as well. Yeah. I think when people um, people often say to me when I meet fans, they're like, "Oh my God, you're exactly like I thought you'd be." I love that because I'm like, <laughs> I think there was a period, probably from 2010 to 12, where I was doing too much drinking, too much drugs. I was always hungover. I was also starting to become really famous, mm. and I, I don't think I became like a, a really horrible person. I was just a bit cockier. I just thought I was, I was trying to be Liam and Noel Gallagher. Yeah, but hold on a minute. But you did give as good as you got. Like, I remember... I, was I, was I used to dish out abuse on Twitter. Yeah. And then we used to... You just, just, just kind of... But the way now you I'm just, like, so fucking peace and love with mm. everyone about mm. everything. Is that is that wisdom with age? Yeah, that's wisdom with age. Yeah. But also, it's just because you realise, like, my kids are seven and four. And it's just, like, you can't react. Like, like, like for instance... <laughs> it's like, I, I love an illegal path. Like, it's my favourite thing. And mm. in the UK, you might... You know, you might get a ticket or a worse thing, like a clamp. Yeah. In Australia, they don't really do much, so I just love doing illegal parking. Well, I'm like just parking up on a, on park, a fire park, hydrant no, or something. Just, no, not that bad, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm going to park. And then I realised, my missus is like, you can't do that. I was like, but no one cares. And yeah. she was just like, I care because our kids are subconsciously watching you do this mm. and they're going to grow up thinking they can do whatever they want in certain situations. I was like, you're so right. It's true, isn't it? And then it's like... if. And if I didn't have the kids, I'd just be there still doing illegal parking. Yeah. But it's the fact that Erin's just like, babe, think about this. Like, we Think about the, the young men we're raising here. We want them to be law-abiding citizens, mm. you know? Yeah. There's certain rules are in place for certain reasons. And I was like, yeah, but it's such a simple... She was like, yeah, but then they're going to grow up thinking they're better than everyone else. And you don't think you're better than everyone else, but you're so used to getting away with things yeah, getting away with it. by virtue of being famous or people letting you off, or this, people this giving you... This comes into mind, this. People, yeah, <laughs> or people giving you freebies, or, yeah. you know, it's like, you walk into a restaurant, oh, we're full. Oh, it's example, yeah, you can have a table. Yeah, That's yeah. really not fair on the other people waiting, but I'm going to take the table. But, <laughs> and then, but also... I always felt like a... When I did that, oh my God, I just, sorry, I'm really sorry, 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 walking away from the queue of hate. <laughs> but the maddest thing is when I'm walking around um, like a shopping mall, a shopping mall, 
um, yeah. in in Australia, and they've got like the massive. They've got big Westfields everywhere. You know, we're in London. We've got oh, we've got Stratford and yeah, Shepherd's Bush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Australia, there's Westfields everywhere. Yeah. Like in the middle of nowhere, but it'll be an amazing yeah. you know, bowling and cinema and all the restaurants and shops, etc. So whenever we go to a Westfield, my eldest says, Dad, Stada, stop knowing everyone. Because <laughs> he get people go, walk past and go, hi, mate. And Aussies are so blunt as well. They go, don't like your music, just want to say hi. Or they're just like, or they really? just be like, yeah. Or they'll be like, hey, mate, big fan. Don't need a picture. No, I don't want a picture. Have a good day. Or, oh, mate, your missus is fit. Don't like your music. Also, <laughs> whatever. Oh, man. Or, you know, people come over and they want a selfie. I love it. And like, I, I stand out quite a bit in Oz. I just think it's because... I just look. Well, you're quite tall, and you people I'm quite know you. tall, and I look completely like different to most. Success beacon. It just I kind dress of, very differently to people in Brisbane. I may be in Sydney and Melbourne. I'd probably slot in a bit one more. One of the London-y kind yeah, of. Way. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Brisbane's like I stand out like a sore thumb. Yeah. So yeah, my eldest Evander, he's like, Dad, Dad, stop knowing everyone all the time. You just know everyone. I was like, No, they. And then Aaron's like, No, they they like Dad's music. He just said he didn't like Dad's music. <laughs> Evander, Evander looks like a bit of a rock star though in the sh shots though, isn't it? Yeah, Evander and Enyo, they're both... Evander's like a little genius and Enyo's like a little He's like rock goes star. for the camera. He's like looking like mm. on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Enyo's... Um, uh, it's mad because I named Evander after obviously Holyfield and it means benevolent ruler. Uh, and and he That's kind of cool. feels like he's already on that tip. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's like very in control and... Very um, studious, he's very smart. Mm. His room's like immaculate, mm. tidy. So I can see he's going to be like a good leader. Mm. Whereas Enyo, who I named after Morricone, um, who's like one of my favorite composers, he is just art and creativity and madness and wow. entertainer. So they've kind of like, they've, mm. they've both sort of somehow. They're completely different kids, and that's what's a fascinating thing about kids. Kids are, mm. and like, there's little bits where they're like me, and little bits where they're like their mum. But mm. how different they are. That's so sweet. Isn't it? And this, this was wow. getting onto this. What we were just chatting about in the coffee shop downstairs about not wanting to drink as much or wanting to be fitter and healthier. Mm. It's as you see, it's not just holding a baby. Yeah, holding a baby is an amazing feeling. But it's you're like, oh, wow, they're they're growing up into little people now. They're little men. Bonkers. You know, yeah. and then you're just like. They're independent and like, and then that is the sort of sobering thought of where am I in my life? And I need to see, the, I want to see these kids have their own kids. And it's that, it's, I, didn't, I didn't really get that when they were mm. say three and one, yeah. seven and four, and they're going to school and they're getting school reports. And then like, you know, the teacher's talking about their personality and stuff. And then you're like, I need to be here to see these kids grow up. Wow. You know what I mean? When, and I, I think I was even reckless like four or five years ago. So mm. both of them were born. Mm. But I, was, I wasn't I was like an alcoholic. I wasn't drinking all day, every day. But I mean, alcoholics don't have to be people who drink all day, every day. But you can be sober for three days, but then just get battered. Yeah. And think every Friday and Saturday, that's still an alcoholic. Mm. If, you, if you're saying to yourself, every Friday and Saturday, I'm going to drink all day. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. And it, that's, it's more of the long game of that attitude. That, that, it's not that attitude. About, even if you're like, I just have one glass of wine with dinner every night. But if you do it every night. If you do it every night, yeah. it's, a for, it's a form of alcoholism. That's right. Um, so I was just like, it's got to get shit in order. You mm. know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm 40 next year. I'm like, I need to get to at least 65 if I want to see these kids maybe get married or have yeah. their own kids. And or see the fruits of your labour. And fruits of your labour. <laughs> Otherwise, it's all been for nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Otherwise, it's just like, oh, yeah, my dad died and he's left it behind some music, you know. Mm. And I, okay, there's seven albums there, but yeah. and he's got all these pictures of his gigs, but and I want the best I want, seats in a restaurant, but what's yeah, it mean? But yeah, he's bought us this lovely house. Yeah. But I, I wish he was here to see me get married. Because yeah, that's really you know all I mean? it is. Yeah, that's all it is, really. And that's the kind of th the, the sobering thoughts. Sobering you are. You haven't been drinking and you're. you're well, I, I, I do, lifestyle. but like, I'm just like, I've, I've been here for three and a half weeks now. Let's talk about. Let's, hold on, hold on one second. But, oh, no, I don't want to don't want to deviate at all too much. Uh, tell us about the other, Elliot. Tell us about the other example. The Dream. before the before the sobriety. Tell this is the real. This is what this podcast is about. <laughs> tell us about the shenanigans of example uh, post post ministry. Pre ministry, I was an asshole. Talk to me about the talk to me about the consumption. Talk to me about because you know talk to me about the partying. I don't know, mate. It was just like probably five five nights a week. 
Really? Yeah, I mean, I'd get up, I'd, I'd, I'd probably wake up at midday sometimes, probably cancel a photo shoot or a meeting or a studio session. I was always really good at sort of like getting up and still going for a run along the mm. river. Mm -mm. Not only to sober myself up, but I, I thought that that gave me an excuse to carry on the next day. Yeah, exactly. So Delete what you did the night before. I might have looked like I was in decent shape, but I don't know. I just, the stuff that I was putting into my body was ridiculous, mm -hmm. and it was probably non-stop for three years. Really? Non-stop for three years? Yeah. <sighs> like, as occasionally, I'd go back to Australia to, to visit my mum and dad. Mm. before, And then whenever, because my mum and dad aren't big drinkers, um, I'd be well, I'd go to theirs and maybe I'd have a whole week mm. and have like maybe one beer in a week, mm -hmm. which kind of felt like a nice detox. Mm. Um, but it, like for instance, like 2014, I did 128 gigs, uh, 116 flights and 128 gigs. And you drank your way through that? I, I would I'd probably have 10 units of alcohol at every gig, at least. Fuck's sake! Wow. And that was I didn't I didn't do one gig sober. Mm. Stupid. Yeah, yeah. When you think about it. Yeah. I've had, and I mean, I've, like, I've I've done five festivals since I've been here, mm. and they're the only times where I've drunk. But now I'll have one beer before I go on stage, mm. and then maybe three or four drinks afterwards. And that's kind of it. That's and your that's, night out. And that's it. Yeah. And I'm cool with that. Yeah. But I can go to the pub now and have lunch and not have a beer, mm. which I couldn't do before. Um, I can go out for dinner with mm. with friends and like have two drinks and stop myself, take myself out of the situation, and take take myself home. Mm. So. It's just about doing that now, like, yeah. like the other. So last Wednesday, mm. I I got an honorary doctorate from uh, what? from the University of London. Yeah, for come on, Doctor of Music, Ovs, Ovs, Doctor of Music. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, do you expect proud here? On so we, you, as you see the pic on my Instagram, I look like something like fucking Hogwarts, <laughs> like with a sorting hat on. <laughs> um, so I've gone to uh, I get to my doctorate, and we went to the pub after. And it wasn't actually too crazy. It wasn't like, eh, it was just like, we had a nice. Is that what you were your boys? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I had like steak and, and chips, and it was like a pint, and then another pint, and then maybe four or five old fashions. Yeah. And Beautiful. then it got to like 9 p.m., and everyone was like, oh, we're going back to yours, Earl. Because I live around my flat's mm -hmm. around the corner on the Thames. Mm. Like, nah. What? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, nah. Like, oh. I was like, yeah, yeah, mate, I've got, I've got an interview tomorrow morning at 8am. I'm going to get up and go for a run and then go to an interview. And they were all like... Gutted. Yeah. But no, but they're like, what, two of them were actually like, I like this new Elliot. Yeah. Gave me a hug and they were on their way. They were like, I'm going to wake up so so happy tomorrow and so fresh. Sometimes you've got to have the disciplinarian in the I room. didn't have that discipline before. Mm. When, when you're on the other side of the world missing your wife and kids... That's the old, that's a big one, isn't it? And, and do you know the hardest thing is waking up lonely in an apartment, in a lovely apartment in Fulham on the river and waking up and hating it because there's no noise. Mm. There's no kids. Yeah. There's no cuddles. Yeah. There's no, oi, right, what are you doing? Like, and play fighting and putting the bowl down and, you know, like, the, the, the four-year-old makes his own cereal and the seven-year-old's like... <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But oh, I just all those little man. things, like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. getting them ready for school and then my oldest does his homework in the mornings and then I take the little one, Enyo, he will go out and water the herbs in the front garden because I've got a herb garden, which I take care, good care of. It's like my third child. Mm -hmm. And then feed the cat. And then we open up all the doors in the house because it's obviously lovely and warm. Yeah. But it's most of the time, so you open all the, all the windows and doors up so you have this amazing breeze come through the whole house the whole day. Ugh. And it's just those sort of things. By the way, you should see that the, you got one hell of a... I mean, El Hornet, as I did mention to you, El Hornet from Pendulum he, we were chatting and he goes have you seen Elliot's house yet Jesus Christ tell him to get some pictures to you they're fucking it's fucking incredible <laughs> that was a bad yeah. impression sorry El that was quite a good impression <laughs> no it's, it's, it's a mad little um, it's, a, it's like a they call it an old Queenslander it's basically like a, a little bungalow mm. that was built on a small hill mm. and they kept the original house and just I didn't do it the guys who construction and architects and they just turned what was essentially a one bedroom how bungalow into this five level man, it's man some fucking grand design shit yeah it's like grand designs isn't it? isn't it and we've got like a dual entrance we've got a front door yeah. and then another entrance down the bottom and then like oh it's just it's, just, it's like, all it's open isn't home. it yeah it's all open isn't it all like, open yeah all the windows well. like it's all yeah, yeah. But, but did you ever worry about the insects and stuff going in crawling you know like spiders, spiders. I mean my, it's a very wife, British question isn't it luckily my wife's really good with spiders like yeah. she used to work at a zoo right. so before she won um, before she did um, FHM Student yeah. of the Year and Standard. 
Miss Universe and all that sort yeah. of standard stuff that Big women dad do. Up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, most wives. Uh, Come before, on, talk that shit. Come on. Before she did that, she worked in a zoo. So she's amazing with animals. Yo. Um, she's not very good with snakes, but luckily we I've, I've seen... In three years, I've seen a snake four times. Have you? Two, po- two poisonous, venomous, and two safe ones. So we have green, green tree snakes, which I'll actually pick up. They're really like quite gentle, yeah, yeah, and the yeah. kids play with them. Yeah, yeah. Like the kids play really gentle with That's them. That's cool. But then there's uh, spiders I can't handle, whereas Erin's amazing. She'll just go out. So they have these things called huntsmen. Huntsmen's are about the size, they can go to the size of your hand. Yeah, they're massive, aren't they? And they look like tarantulas, but yeah. they're, they're safe. They're completely safe. So she'll just go over and just literally pick it up by its. Yeah. By its body. And then just go, come on, mate. And just put it out in the... Oh, God, that's cool. Um, yeah, she's a bit mad like that. Mm. Um, she hates cockroaches. I hate cockroaches. But I'm, I, I quite like the crunch of the cockroach, so I'll, go, yeah, I'll chase the cockroach. But <laughs> since we've got the cat, the cat catches everything. The cat will get the spiders, eat the spiders, get the cockroaches. Eat the... Secret weapon, see? And then people, and then my kids let the cat lick their face. I'm like, not only has he been <laughs> licking his ass, he's been eating spiders yeah. and cockroaches. I've never understood people to do that with their animals. <laughs> yeah, no with their way. dogs. Come here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's like, that, wrong not with only has that dog been licking its own ass, yeah. it's been licking that dog's yeah. ass. <laughs> yeah. Which has been licking its owner's face. The fuck's wrong with you? Yeah, and, and that's how he got fucking COVID. COVID, yeah. That's <laughs> Do- dogs create COVID. Do- dogs were licking a bat's ass. Talk to me about, <laughs> talk to me about the studio process, Elliot. Tell me about... Tell me about uh, the the creative process and and how because let's remember you are a doctorate of of, uh, <laughs> of art- artistical integrity and uh, you've uh, and also you it know it used what? to be very different it used to be I get, get sent a lot of beats right which is the hip hop way isn't it yeah, you know always. people play you stuff always. and then even when I started making dance music I'd be sent a beat right. uh, so maybe ten percent of the music was made from scratch maybe starting at the piano mm. everything else was a beat me writing over a section of that beat. And then the producer taking that away and turning it into a song, mm. and then that's going back and forth. So like, kicks kickstarts for instance, there was probably version twenty seven was the one that was released. Twenty seven. So there's twenty seven versions of that song. So to from get it implementation perfect. to yeah, completion, yeah. mastering. Th- we've got to have three different masterings. Now, yeah, yeah. No, Sub Focus mixed and mastered that himself. But Amazing. that song was, uh, I think, the most versions we've ever done of a song. I think Change the Way You Kiss Me maybe did twenty five versions. Stay Awake, which I did with Nero, which was number mm. one as well. That. That was maybe version 22 or 21. So there's a, wow. there, there's a lot of perfectionism mm. that goes into it. Um, because you're thinking, I'm not, I wasn't ever really thinking about um, Spotify back then. You don't. Because now people think about Spotify, the intro on a song, just yeah. because of skip rates. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. if it skips past the first seven seconds. So they want to have you back invested in the song yeah. within the first yeah. two, three seconds. Um, so what, what we were doing back then is I was just trying to get it perfect for festivals and clubs. Because it's dance music, and then you and then someone at the radio would maybe tweak it for radio, which yeah, is fine. Yeah. Whereas now everything I'm doing, I, I usually go into the studio with a baseline idea, Damn. and the whole new album's pretty much UK garage two step the whole way through, with a couple of grime influences, and then there's a few two drum and bass songs, and then there's two kind of French house Daft Punk vibes. Nice. Um, but everything just comes from me usually starting with a baseline, mm. and then I sing the baseline in, and we turn that into MIDI. And then, that, and then we, my producer James Angus, who's done an Aussie guy in Brisbane, he's done most of the new album. He'll just take the MIDI of my me singing the bass line, and then that's the that's where the song starts. That's been really important having someone so close in Brisbane to work with. Yeah, he lives well, his studio is ten minutes from me, and I we got, we can start. I can get everything done in the morning that I need to do for the whole day, whether that's shopping or watering mm. my herbs or cooking dinner for the kids and having it in the fridge or going training with my wife. Yeah. I start start studio at twelve, and then I'm always home to read to the kids. Like by six thirty wow. seven. Jesus Christ, that's a see. This this is it's, mate. It's, honestly, it's a dream. It's a dream come true. Like yeah. I might only go in the studio like twice a week, yeah. but I made the whole. This is my eighth album. I made the whole album between November and February. Do you let them get on with it a lot of times, or do you have to be there present? Is it a case of that you know them well enough? I won't, as producers? I won't leave the studio until all my ideas are down. So mm. whether that sound effects, samples, uh, arpeggios, mm. um, a string section, a horn section, mm. like obviously all digital. Mm. Um, I haven't got a fucking orchestra. <laughs> but um, Not yeah. like you used to, do yeah. them days. But I'll try, I'll probably, I won't leave the studio until the whole song sort of, there's a shape, mm. there's a three minute, four minute shape to a song. But you can walk away and say, right, that's how I know And it. then that's I know that is. James will go away and finesse it. Yeah. And then... Yeah, and that's, it's been an amazing experience working with him because he's just, I've never, he's kind of like 
the only producer who's kind of like, I feel like is on a, I'm not saying he's as good as Calvin Harris, but Calvin Harris can just do everything. Like, mm. He's an amazing vocal producer. He can play most instruments. Mm. And, he, and everything comes from his head. And I kind of feel like with James, I've got that same approach. Mm. Um, obviously, if we start having some success, then they'll say he's as good as Calvin. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's, 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 like, people used to give Calvin a lot of stick, especially people in, used to have arguments with people in bands and stuff, you know? Like saying it wasn't real music. He's and a multi, multi millionaire. Like, no, but, <laughs> but when you watch him break down the songs that he's made, yeah, he's playing every instrument. Yeah, and he, that's and, the he, thing. and he mixes it. Does and it masters all, he's it. A one, he's a one. And, then if, and if he wants to, he sings it as well. Yeah, it's bonkers. That's fucking. There's only a few people who can do that. Or yeah. Cr Skrillex. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Yeah, them I mean, two maybe that's it. Skrillex, yeah. I mean, Chase's status are pretty high levels. Like, I mean, between them, they but can play a though. few. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who else is there. I don't know. I don't think there's anyone. I mean, I've worked, I've been fortunate enough to work with some of the best in the world. Like I worked with Stuart Price. Who's Stuart Price? So Stuart Price made Madonna's massive comeback album, oh, like what? sort of fifteen years ago. Ray of Light and all that. Yeah, kind of and thing, then yeah. he did um, the Killers. Um, oh, what? And then the Pet Shop Boys, and he's mate. If you is that how you connect with Pet Shop Boys? Yeah. yeah okay. So if you look at Stuart Price's list, he's one of the best producers of all time, and he's one of those guys. He kind of does everything himself. The other guy I worked with, Fraser T. Smith, who I've seen, he's done like Adele and Rita War, mm. and he did the early Tinchy and End Up stuff, but he's probably more famous recently for Stormzy's albums, Stay at Dave, mm. um, you know. So he's another guy where you're in with him and he'll either start on the guitar or on the piano. That's just a good and feeling to know. And then just builds this whole song himself from that's, start to finish. Yeah, that's cool, isn't it? But I don't know if he mixes it. And, I mean, he can, but that's what I mean. I think there's Calvin and Skrillex are pretty much the mm. only two... There's got to be some hip hop producers, maybe. I've got to big up James Russian as well. Does it, Fungia? Yeah, he's a he's a one hitter as well. Um, I mean, like even like Timberland. I mean, Pharrell's probably on that level. Pharrell, I think. But, but then, most of these guys have engineers as yeah, well. Yeah, that's it. Like they're ideas men, but the they've actually got behind the machine. Yeah, there's other people in the room. Whereas we're talking about people where there's just one man in the one room. One man, which which also there's no rules. There's, there's no a, rules. You know, as long as you get the good song at the end of it. I can play piano a bit, I can play drums a bit, but I'm not going to get on stage yeah. and do it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. I like, I tr will always try and get the best vocal performance out of it and write the best mm. like, bars possible. Mm. Um, but I've never really tried to compete with anyone. I'm just trying to compete myself constantly. I feel like you definitely compete with yourself a lot. Yeah. I think, don't get it twisted. You are super like competitive, aren't you? Yeah. You really have I get it from my dad. And like, so I called my dad, he was living in Australia. So, Dad, watch the sun come up. It's 18 in the charts. My dad was like, well done, son. Let me know when it's you've got a top 10. The next single was number, oh, hey. number, the next single was number six in the charts. My dad went, well done, son. Let me know when you've got a number one. Got number one. How do you get to a number one in uh, your mind? How, you, how, does, how, does, how, does, how does one person with that sort of tenacity... What, I, just didn't, I didn't want to stop. I, just, but I, wasn't, I didn't overthink it. I just Every time I wrote a song for about a three or four year period, I was trying to write the best mm. song possible. So it doesn't matter who was in there. Yeah. Don't, you don't need a one-shot like, producer. It, like, it had to start with a massive riff. Mm. It had to have a drop. Maybe it had a rap in the mm. middle, like a 16, eight bar rap. But I just wanted the opening lyric to grab you. Because mm. I, you know, never been afraid of the highest heights. Right, I'm in. Mm. I'm into this song. Already in. And then the tagline. Yeah. And, but basically all my songs, if you go back to all my songs from 2011 and 12, all of the lyrics are grunge and blues inspired. Everything's inspired by like Nirvana, pretty much. Yeah, like I can hear it. You know, like when you like if if you take away the electronic element mm. and listen to my performances, yeah. I'm just basically trying to do my version of fucking Kurt Cobain. Like, yeah, yeah. I've never been afraid of the highest heights or afraid of flying. Mm. I've never been afraid of the wildest fights or mm. afraid of dying. Mm, mm, mm. They're like a fucking grunge lyric, mm, mm. and pretty then much, yeah. and then you change oh, yeah. the way you kiss me. Like they're all my songs were depressing. They're about. Cheating on my girlfriend, staying up too late, doing too many drugs. Basically grunge music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything from that era. Like, think about the lyrics to Stay Awake. If we don't kill ourselves, we'll be the leaders of a messed up generation. Mm. That's a fucking punk band shit. That's yeah, yeah, not, yeah, 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 yeah. That's not EDM. That's a fucking punk band shit. It's true. And it's, it's, it's social commentary. Did we take it too far? Did we chase the rabbit into Wonderland, lose yeah. 100 grand? Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? All these things, they're not, they're not rap. They're not necessarily electronic. They're all borrowed from grunge and rock because that's what I grew yeah. up on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I was a, a Wu-Tang fan, yeah. but I was a, like, and the dominant culture was black culture at school yeah. in terms of what kicks everyone, well and how everyone spoke yeah, and yeah. what uh, 
what, what designer clothes you'd be wearing. Hold on, or... and, and yes, last night he was with Brian Johnson from ACDC. Come on, give us yeah. some on that. That like this is he's he's he's, 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 he's he, I hadn't seen him for a few years, and he's <laughs> like we, we went on a race around Italy with Jaguar years ago. It was like the Milli Milia, which is the thousand mile race between Brescia to Roma and back to Brescia all through the, the back doubles and streets of, of Italy. Wow. And it was Brian Johnson. He was in a Jaguar D-Type and I was in an XK120. And every now and again, I'd get a bit ahead and then he'd just fly past me because he's an amazing racing mm. driver. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's so we'd had this two-week two where yeah. we'd all be racing classic cars on Italy and then getting battered at night. And Brian would be going to... 1 a.m. and still getting up at 6 a.m. I feel like I'm getting smaller and smaller in a seat. So it sounds like a Jack and Nori kind of story. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, no, you I... really know the guys. That's the yeah, fucking yeah. man. But yeah, it's, it's amazing. He came to Brisbane. Uh, ACDC played a gig in Brisbane. It's like 40,000. Yeah, lovely. And I was like, hey, how many guests this can I have? And he was just like, mate, Elliot, my boy, I'm as many as you like, mate. And he's, he's giving me, we had like maybe 40 guests. And then not only that, invites us all backstage into the dressing room afterwards. And him and the entire band and crew are just walking around chatting to like my wife's mum and my my brother-in-law, giving do everyone this. shots. And do you want a photo? Do you want a signed <laughs> poster? Get them a t-shirt. <laughs> like literally the. And it's when you see that, I was just like, oh my god, they're the, the biggest band in the yeah. world. They're probably in the top five biggest bands of all time. All time. I biggest mean, what? selling. Iron as well. Maiden. Yeah. Queen. Like. ACDC. ACDC. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like. Maybe Metallica, maybe U2, but I don't know. I don't think anyone toured on the level ACDC and Iron Maiden did. They were like the two. Mm. They always sold the most tickets yes. in the most countries. And they were the mo he's, they're the most down-to-earth, normal people mm. it's ever. It's good to know, man. And it's almost like when you hear about people being divas, you're just like, I'm not going to name names, but there's friends of mine in the industry, and they're my mates, and then sometimes afterwards you wouldn't be allowed to go see them because they need time to himself. And then there's ACDC inviting yeah. 40 people they don't know into their yeah. dressing room and giving them all drinks. I think we all know those. Ones. Fuck you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like but it, it kind of like, I, I do like to come off stage and wind down for five minutes, mm. stick my feet in a bucket of ice so I don't get a tendonitis and my Achilles. And, but other than that, I'm just like, let everyone in. And they're mm. like, you sure? Mm. Like my security or two managers are like, you sure? I'm just like, let them all in. Yeah, and yeah, then they come it. in, I'm like, just don't talk to me because I'm in a zone. Take all the Monster Munch yeah. <laughs> and drink as much as you like. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, of course. And I'll be gonna... 15 minutes. Just and give then, me a like, minute. My cousin's there with his mate. His mates. I was like, mate, what size are you? 11. Take my trainers. Cool. Have my kicks. Are you sure? Yeah, just fuck off. Just let me. <laughs> you know, I've just come off. I've been on stage oh, for 90 minutes. Yeah. I just need to. That is bonkers. You are really good live, aren't you? I'm all right. I'm all about I've energy, seen you man. From the beginning to the inset to, to now, like you've, you've. You've known me 16 years. Yeah. I've known you 16 yeah, years, I sorry. I was actually debating this with Kat downstairs, big up Kat. Um, also, big up Ashley, say hello to Ashley for me. Hello, Ashley. Yeah, she's in Canada. Hello. Hello, Ashley in Canada. <laughs> um, big fan of yours. Uh, and I've seen you from uh, from such an early day. There you go, that's the answer. That's to, the be sure, to be sure. Um, I've seen you from such an early inception of your uh, career. And, and just to see you blossom in the performance levels that you do. And I've seen it from bands to now the DJ thing. It's... Uh, I mean, it's more compact and more all about yeah, you holding the court. Yeah, it's just like, when I had the band, I loved the band shows, but it would be touring with 15 people. Yeah, it's a nightmare. There's like four on stage, but then it's all the people behind, you know, it's the laptops guy yeah. and then the monitors guy and then the sound guy and then the visuals guy. And yeah. then the, now it's just me, DJ, sound, visuals. A lot more fun. And a lot more fun. And like, we can have so much fun with the visuals. Like some of the visuals in our show, there's a bit, a section in the show where it just goes for all the shittest haircuts I've had over the years. <laughs> but all like, all like animated and pixelated and like, yeah. then we have a Keith Flint tribute Ooh. halfway through the show. So that's nice to get a little bit Tough. of that up in there. And then there's a whole section where it's just like fans through the years. So it's just like close-ups of fans on fo you know, footage from gigs from the last 15 years. Oh man, that's like, wicked. From, like, you know, 11 year olds to 60 year olds to really bad shaky footage from 2007 to right up to Rena's shows. And so there's a little celebration of the fans, wicked. a tribute to Keith Flint, you know, who I always, Got, I was like, that's how energetic I need to be on stage. Mm. And then they're like, the, the haircuts through the years, just make everyone like, give everyone a little giggle. <laughs> and then there's like, we'd have like a little bootleg of like, uh, like the Holy Goof uh, baseline bootleg of a Drake song. And so then I'm just like, everyone make some noise, Drake's here. And everyone goes, and it's just like, <laughs> a sort of, you know, uh, South Park, <laughs> Terrence and Philip. 
Drake on stage. <laughs> like, ha, 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 ha. Like, you know, so it's just like, I want it to be a fucking experience. I want it to be a rave. Yeah, yeah. But I want it to be a celebration of everything I care about, which is, there's a bit of, when my wife's up on screen from the all night video, you know, where she's yeah, dancing course, in our living yeah. room. So it's like, ladies and gentlemen, she's, she can't be here tonight, but make some noise to my wife. And then we get my wife on FaceTime and then we put that up on the big screen. That really happens in real yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So we have all, all this... Oh man, that so it's is just wicked. like you know, there's no band, yeah. but it's a fucking experience. It's a mm. night out, and then I feel feel like at the end, of it, everyone feels connected. You know what I mean? Mm. And then I'll be like, everyone put, uh, grab hold of the person next to you, and then up on the screen, it's almost like a a DIY sort of matchstick man walking over, going, "May I put my arm around you?" <laughs> like that. And, then, and then we get a big group hug, and then what the fucking you know things just you really engage and bring people yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. That's why people dig you, see? That's why uh, my friend said, you know, he's, he's one of us. That's the, I'll pick up. That's the essence, isn't it? Um, so we're seeing shows. That's going to be here. In the, I mean, obviously, you're not going to be in the UK for too much longer. By the time we get this, it's going to be late. Well, in the, the UK day. tour, January, February is on, on sale now. Boom. Uh, we've sold, we just sold out Manchester and Glasgow. Mm. I think we've done 3,000 tickets for Brixton already, which is mind blowing. Wow. Wow. Other people have, like, they said to me, apart from Liam Gallagher, we've got the best son in tour percentage-wise. Right, that's what I'm going to. That's me. Bush, bush, bush. <laughs> ready. I don't uh, really need to plug it, do I? No, it's already done. <laughs> it's already done. Uh, um, fucking pleasure having you on, my mate, brother. It's been amazing. And, it's uh, fucking great. Long time. Sorry it took so long. Don't worry. We're here. We're always here. We're out here. We're on the street. We're on the street. We're doing it. Big shout. Example inside the place. My guy. My guy. My guy. Right, out like anyone's out of fashion. Don't forget sharing is caring. Don't talk to anyone. I wouldn't, all right? <laughs> Killer Killer Vloggers, Alloy was out of fashion, peace!